Hello and welcome. I'm Christopher Medina Dio, and today we're going to explore reflexes and facilitation, fundamental concepts that form the neurophysiological basis of osteopathic diagnosis and treatment. These concepts will help you understand how the body's nervous system creates patterns of dysfunction that we commonly see in clinical practice. By the end of this session, you'll be able to describe a simple reflex arc, define the four major types of reflexes relevant to osteopathic practice, and explain the concept of facilitation, especially as it relates to chronic dysfunction and segmental findings. Let's begin with the somatic nervous system. This is the branch of the nervous system responsible for voluntary movement. It includes sensory neurons that bring information from the body to the spinal cord and motor neurons that control skeletal muscle. This system is essential for how we perceive and respond to the world through touch, movement, and posture. Here's a quick review of spinal cord organization. Sensory input enters the spinal cord through the dorsal root, while motor output exits through the ventral root. The basic anatomy is crucial to understanding how reflex arcs are wired. A reflex is a rapid, involuntary, and predictable response to a stimulus. Reflexes serve protective and regulatory roles in the body. And as osteopathic physicians, we recognize that many patterns of somatic dysfunction are based in reflex activity. A simple reflex arc involves five components, a receptor that detects a stimulus, an afferent neuron that carries the signal to the spinal cord, an integration center, usually in the dorsal horn, an efferent neuron that transmits a motor command, and finally, an effector such as a muscle or gland. Let's look at the patellar reflex. Tapping the patella tendon activates stretch receptors in the quadriceps. This signal travels via the afferent neuron to the spinal cord where it synapses with a motor neuron. The efferent output leads to contraction of the quadriceps muscle. This is a classic example of a somatic reflex. Reflex circuits don't always stay local. Interneurons connect afferent and efferent neurons and can relay signals across multiple levels. These circuits also link into autonomic pathways, particularly the sympathetic chain, contributing to visceral involvement. Now let's shift to the autonomic nervous system, which manages involuntary functions. It regulates smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands to maintain homeostasis. It has two primary branches, the sympathetic or fight or flight system, and the parasympathetic or rest and digest system. The enteric nervous system is sometimes considered a third branch, but won't be covered in detail here. The sympathetic system prepares the body to deal with stress. It increases alertness, dilates airways, raises heart rate, and shifts blood flow to muscles. These pathways originate in the spinal cord between T1 and L2, travel through the sympathetic chain, and extend to target organs. In contrast, the parasympathetic system supports rest recovery, and digestion. These pathways originate in cranial nerves and in the sacral spinal cord, referred to as craniosacral outflow, and synapse near or within their target organs. Autonomic reflexes include an afferent limb from the viscera, an integration center in the spinal cord or brainstem, and an efferent limb that passes through a peripheral autonomic ganglion. These arcs influence involuntary functions like blood pressure, digestion, and respiratory rate. A viscerosomatic reflex occurs when visceral input, such as from an inflamed organ, produces a somatic response, like increased muscle tension or tenderness in a segmentally related area. In cholecystitis, for example, the gallbladder receives its sympathetic innervation from and sends corresponding increased afferent signals to spinal segments T5 through T9. This may result in reflex muscle hypertonicity changes in temperature or moisture, and tenderness over the right upper thoracic region at the T5 to T9 levels. These are the physical signs of a viscerosomatic reflex. Somatosomatic reflexes occur entirely within the musculoskeletal system. A localized somatic stimulus, like muscle strain, can result in a segmentally related somatic response, such as muscle spasm or postural compensation. A classic example is the withdrawal reflex. If you step on a sharp object, sensory input from the foot triggers a spinal reflex that flexes the injured leg and extends the opposite leg for balance. 
Other examples include reciprocal inhibition, where there is a reflexive relaxation of the antagonist muscle in response to a primary muscle contraction, and reflexive diaphragm mechanics changes due to cervical strain affecting phrenic nerve outflow. Somatovisceral reflexes occur when a somatic input influences a visceral organ, often through autonomic efferents. This explains how dysfunction in the spine or muscles can contribute to visceral symptoms. For example, tightness in the upper cervical spine after whiplash injury can affect the vagus nerve, triggering nausea. Or chronic paraspinal tension in the thoracolumbar region can disrupt bowel motility. These are somatovisceral reflexes. Viscerovisceral reflexes occur between internal organs, mediated through shared neural pathways. These are common in autonomic regulation and explain crosstalk between systems. A myocardial infarction can activate visceral afferents from the heart, which also project to GI-related spinal segments. This can produce nausea or vomiting, even though the stomach itself is unaffected. This is a classic visceral visceral reflex. Let's briefly review and compare the four reflex types. Viscerosomatic and somatovisceral reflexes represent crosstalk between viscera, internal organs, and soma, musculoskeletal system. Somatosomatic and visceral visceral reflexes remain within their respective domains. All are relevant to an osteopathic approach to patient assessment. Now let's introduce the concept of facilitation. Developed by Denslow and Core, the concept of facilitation describes a spinal segment that remains in a state of heightened excitability. It takes less input to trigger a response, and that response is often exaggerated. Facilitation is defined as the maintenance of a pool of neurons in a state of subthreshold excitation. This can result from prolonged afferent input or changes in neuron environment. Once established, facilitation may persist due to normal central nervous system activity alone. At its core, facilitation involves a simple spinal reflex, afferent input, spinal processing, and efferent output. But in reality, incoming signals are distributed across multiple levels, affecting both motor and autonomic neurons through complex interneuron networks. These signals don't stay isolated. They send collaterals up and down the spinal cord, cross over to the contralateral side, and influence sympathetic or parasympathetic pathways depending on the region. This makes facilitation a multi-system issue. Facilitation can be driven by input from three sources, higher centers like the brain, visceral afferents from internal organs, or somatic afferents like muscle spindles and nociceptors. Chronic input from any of these can prime a segment. Once interneurons become sensitized, their output increases, not just locally, but to surrounding muscles and even visceral structures. This increased activity can persist, creating a self-reinforcing cycle unless actively disrupted. Facilitated segments are often associated with aberrant reflexes. Increased mechanoreceptor activity makes referred pain more likely at locations innervated by the same spinal levels. Similarly, chronic low-level visceral irritation can create facilitated segments at the regions of the spine that provide sympathetic and or parasympathetic nerve supply to the affected organ. This is why facilitation becomes such an important concept in osteopathic perspectives on health and disease. Clinically, facilitation presents as increased muscle tone, skin changes in temperature and moisture, and segmental tenderness. These findings persist even after the original injury resolves, making them valuable diagnostic clues. Here's a stepwise example. Step one, the patient suffers an acute injury. Even after it heals, some level of dysfunction remains present in the affected segment or body region, maintained by altered receptor activity. Step two, the patient experiences a new injury in a different region. This new event activates motor and autonomic pathways, but also reactivates the previously sensitized segment. Step three, the patient now reports symptoms in both regions, including the previously affected area that was thought to have recovered. This is due to the lower threshold in the facilitated segment, which is now firing again despite no direct trauma. Understanding facilitation helps us explain chronic or referred pain, segmental tenderness, and persistent dysfunction. As osteopathic physicians, we can identify and treat facilitated segments with OMT 
to help restore autonomic balance and reduce aberrant neural signaling. Let's summarize the key takeaways from today's presentation. Reflex arcs are involuntary, predictable responses to stimuli that underlie many patterns of somatic dysfunction findings we see clinically. The four major reflex types, visceral-somatic, somatosomatic, somatovisceral, and visceral-visceral, help us understand the connections between the soma and viscera. Facilitation explains chronic segmental sensitization and helps us understand why dysfunction persists. Finally, osteopathic manipulative treatment helps resolve dysfunctional reflex activity and supports the body's natural self-regulation mechanisms. Understanding reflexes and facilitation is fundamental to osteopathic practice. These concepts will help you understand the neurophysiological basis of many of the clinical findings you'll encounter and will guide your diagnostic and treatment approaches.